not just women are in danger, but all marginalized people. We're being uniquely different right now might truly be considered a crime. It seems as though we had all slipped into a false sense of comfort, that justice would prevail and that good would win in the end. Well, good did not win this election, but good will win in the end. So what today means is that we are far from the end. Today marks the beginning, the beginning of our story. The revolution starts here. The fight for the right to be free, to be who we are, to be equal. Let's march together through this darkness and with each step know that we are not afraid. That we are not alone. That we will not back down. That there is power in our unity and that no opposing force stands a chance in the face of true solidarity. And to our detractors that insist that this march will never add up to anything, Boston Red here with Friday Java, a weekly magazine of political theory, polling, and commentary. It is part of the Pete history called people that make up this fascinating journey. We are part of the Obama network. For that, we make no apologies. What we pledge to do is give you the facts on a bridge to history, what body politics is, the most up-to-date theories of political science and cephalogy. Stay tuned for this incredible ride. Boston Red, peace out. From WBRN Radio traveling on the Boston Red Network. Friday Jobber on the 3rd of January 2020. Our first Friday Jobber of the year and of the new decade as we roll along. This is Boston Red and Jerry Pippen broadcast booth. An interesting situation here. Uh, we'll, we'll start off with uh, recent developments out of Baghdad. The Iranian general in charge of the Quad Forces of the Revolutionary Guards uh, was assassinated at the airport there, General uh, Soleimani. And it was on the orders of the president. Now, the president had tweeted before the consequences of what was going on with the uh, demonstrations at the U.S. Uh, embassy in uh, downtown uh, Baghdad, known as the Green Zone, and the escalation uh, there. Now, some commentators think it was a move uh, by uh, D.J. Trump to assert his uh, military commander uh, position as a strong uh, commander that would do what he said, Period. The Iranian reaction by the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has basically said that they would uh, retaliate against the U.S. and the Zionists in Israel. Now, what does that basically mean? Well, very difficult to say. These types of situations and uh, miscommunications can uh, cause a greater conflict. Now, within Iraq, a Shiite uh, nation, there had been demonstrations against uh, the Iranians uh, there, widespread, but they were put down, and, of course, also economic conditions uh, there, and the 
people that, or at least some of the people that were demonstrating, uh, were uh, celebrating uh, with the uh, death of General uh, Suleiman. Well, that is a situation in a local uh, operation, but one has to realize that within Iran, there are many, many militias there. There are the Shiite militias. Some uh, have better influence uh, by the Revolutionary Guards, Quad Forces. Some are not. It's a very mixed bag of those operating in that uh, particular uh, theater. Well, we'll we'll see that. And uh, Joe uh, Biden uh, responded that it was a reckless move. Now, that's to counter uh, D.J. Trump. One of the uh, large uh, uh, problems that looms is Wilsonian foreign policy that was orchestrated by the racist uh, President uh, Woodrow Wilson, who had been the president also of Princeton, had a Ph.D., doesn't really matter. He resegregated Washington, D.C., and this policy is based on a colonial policy, uh, period, and neo-colonial policy. And thus, Iraq uh, and Iran would uh, play into this and the whole uh, Middle East uh, scenario. But now the Middle East is vast. The, some of these forces are in uh, various places. Are people related to these forces? are people that show solidarity. That's three different criteria there. Very, very uh, big uh, criteria. But when you look at uh, Iraq, Iran, and then you go into Syria, and then by uh, extension, it could extend, uh, say, into Egypt, and then on to the Zionist uh, Israeli state there. So in Lebanon, all of these people are boarded up together. Some of these uh, same forces or affiliates of these affiliates of these forces are on the borders of various nations, including uh, Saudi Arabia and within Saudi Arabia. There are Shiites in uh, Saudi Arabia. So once again, it's a calc- one of these calculations. If it works uh, for election year purposes, it works. But if uh, things start to go wrong and badly wrong, it affects the uh, election of 2020 in the fall. And the fall is basically uh, 11 months away to 10 months away. We're in January now. Iowa caucus has come up. And the peace movement in uh, this country, it does take... uh, a few days and a few weeks for it to get fully acubated. So thus, uh, people look at it, and also the seriousness. Events move much, much more quickly today than, say, in the early 2000s, uh, 2002, uh, 2003, in the uh, second uh, Iraq war, because the first Iraq war was under uh, President uh, excuse me, George H.W. Bush. And then on the G.W. Bush. But the problem is, as we look at the histories there in Iraq and also in Afghanistan, there were billions of dollars uh, spent. And according to what they, the U.S. military and the political establishment, set as their goals, none were met. Now, in uh, Iraq now, it's a divided country very much divided up and anything could happen at any uh, given time and when you accelerate things uh, you are are, uh, throwing basically lighter fluid on a flame and if it uh, goes well it goes well but if it goes badly it goes badly if there are more attacks more retaliations then it gets out of hand there Now, as far as uh, Iran is concerned, uh, they fought a great war with uh, Iraq. And over a million soldiers died in that war. So that kind of gives you the the uh, intense war, and it lasted uh, about nine years. 
And of course the U.S. at that time was on the side of Baghdad. However, in this particular scenario, things are further complicated. As uh, the markets saw a spike in a petrol price, a temporary spike. Because today, uh, listening at some program at BBC, had excellent program on uh, fossil fuels. They are not what they used to be. It's not what happened in the uh, 70s under uh, Tricky Dick's administration under President Carter, where President Carter warned of U.S. interest in the Mideast. Now, that was an extension of Wilsonian foreign policy. But today, because of other technologies, uh, things are starting to wean. You have uh, solar, uh, turbine, and wind power. But depending on what uh, part of the continent you're in, those things are advancing. Solar panels are becoming cheaper. And at the same time, we have cars that, uh, and more importantly, trucks and buses that do not, or I would just partially uh, depend on fossil fuels. Hybrid buses, electrical buses. And the whole general idea is you electrify your buses and trucks, or as in the UK they're known as lorries, uh, first, and you uh, then you start to electrify uh, locomotives. Um, unfortunately, when the Chinese built the new rail line in uh, Kenya, they used uh, older technology and not the electrical trains that they use. But nonetheless, uh, those technologies are increasingly available. The idea is to move as much uh, material and uh, people as you can and don't expand your uh, footprint. And then you go to automobiles uh, that are turning electrical and you get rid of the intercombustion uh, engine. So those things are coming on the technical uh, scene in terms of technology. The technology is almost there. And what happens, uh, from my experience in software development, what happens is as the software is uh, fully developed and the uh, betas which have been going on, or betas have been going on uh, for a number of years now, and you get into actual production. What we mean by actual production is you get 100,000 units or more out there. And the major car companies have already committed to those units. And you'll see like the new electrical car, uh, the, the Mustang uh, model, that will be an electric car. And the Tesla will not be the only one in the game. And as the technology expands, it will be brought to market cheaper. And the cars will be cheaper. Our automobiles will be cheaper. And various types of automobiles. So this affects the policy in the Mideast. So the question is, in 2020, can the U.S. still operate a policy? Uh, and we won't say on the Ronald Reagan, because Reagan was very sparing in where he went. He went to Granada, but Granada wasn't a large operation to begin with. A nation, it was just more for show and tell. But he never got into things like uh, Iraq, even the first president, Bush, in Iran. He stopped at the gate and left. G.W. Bush extended the war, but he could not win and did not win and, and based upon his criteria. And Afghanistan is still going on. Uh, today, with no winnable situation at all, the Taliban and other uh, Afghan uh, national uh, forces will get Afghanistan back. It's only a matter of time there. So this leaves this situation uh, hanging out here as to where it goes. It's a dangerous situation, literally. So that's all we basically need to uh, say about that. We do remind people that they can find us on uh, YouTube and subscribe there. You can find us at wherever you get your... Uh, internet radio, our uh, podcast materials, whether it be at iHeartMedia. Incidentally, iHeart does have now some stations that play uh, the so-called uh, podcast. And of course, again, that's the internet radio, as uh, the late, great Jerry Pippen did. Incidentally, uh, we uh, 
brought Jerry back for a revisit on the uh, New Year's Eve show for 2019. So you can hear Jerry, and this was a show that I produced in actually 2013 uh, for Jerry Pippin's uh, Productions. And also, um, we added uh, a few current events, but basically he was talking about the same thing. And we'll have to go through the archives and find uh, some comments he had on the Iraq and Afghanistan. We were talking about uh, domestic uh, affordable care, the health site. Well, more problems there. Obamacare had some problems in 2019 and with the exchange, as it's now called. So these ideas linger on and uh, continue to linger on. And uh, we... uh, at WBRN Radio, we'll broadcast them. Let's first go to Austin, Texas here, and this is Alex Jones. Now, this is a civil uh, suit in in uh, the county there. He's ordered to pay uh, $100,000 on a defamation uh, lawsuit uh, on Sandy Hook. Yeah, he's a uh, conspiracy theorist. Now, the conspiracy theorists play a very big uh, role in of the uh, reserve army of D.J. Trump. $100,000, that is, uh, what, 76,000 pounds in legal fees and court costs in a defamation lawsuit against him in cases brought by the father of a child killed at Sandy Hook. And Jones had long claimed, the same claims we have bented around, uh, uh, on his show and InfoWars, that's his site, that the attack was completely fake and a grand hoax. Well, you hear that in the impeachment situation. And out of that, uh, children were killed, 20 of them under, um, let's see here, under 10 and 6 adults were killed and the parents sued for defamation. And you'll see the use of more and more defamation lawsuits concerning things that are written on the uh, web or on the net. And, of course, the standard for defamation is if it's factual, you do not defame a person. But if it is not factual, defamation or libel uh, processes there and malice also plays into that. Anyway, uh, the judge there, uh, Aikens of uh, Travis County, in uh, Texas said Jones, his lawyers intentionally disregarded an uh, October court order to produce witnesses, that's called production, and other materials to the plaintiff in the lawsuit. The uh, Heslin, uh, his son, was a uh, six-year-old. Jesse Lewis was killed in the uh, Massacre. The judge said that failure to cooperate they should be treated as contempt of court in two separate orders. Uh, this is not unusual here. Issued the same day, the judge told Jones to pay sixty-five thousand dollars and thirty-four thousand three hundred and twenty-three dollars in fees uh, incurred by Mr. Heslin. In addition to an early uh, October order against Infowars. Jones and Infowars had been ordered to pay uh, $126,023.80 over the case even before it reaches a uh, trial, the report said. It's hardly a surprise that someone like Jones would soon find himself in contempt of court. Now, he can be actually uh, jailed for that, too. He is uh, now learning the consequences uh, to his utter disrespect of this process that's from Mark Benstrom, one of the uh, lawyers on the case. He's uh, quoted as saying, this is Benstrom uh, by the New York Times, but he expects a uh, trial and defamation case to be uh, scheduled before the end of next year. The lawsuit, of course, is filed in Travis County. That is Austin, Texas. Alleges Jones accused him of lying about holding his uh, son's body uh, with a bullet hole in the head. That's according to the complaint. The lawsuit, of course, is filed where Jones lives and works. Jones is facing a number of lawsuits by uh, several families. And that is the condition that you uh, have. uh, And uh, let's see, did I say 20? 12, uh, no, 20. 20 children age uh, 5 to 10. 
and six staff members were killed at a Sandy Hook. The parents of Sandy Hook victims who have spoken publicly about their experiences had been targeted by trolls both online as well in person. Yeah, some of these uh, characters uh, actually went to their uh, houses. And when one goes to a person's house or attacks them personally uh, with uh, this uh, false information, information that is not uh, factual and can be proven, uh, the uh, father there had to prove uh, by a birth certificate that his son was a quote-unquote natural person and the death certificate. So the proof was there. And this is something that these characters have to watch out for the conspiracy theorists, not only there, but in various other things that they utter. Whether it's on the defamation uh, category, whether it's uh, slander or it's uh, libel of there that... Uh, when people get caught up in these uh, types of lawsuits, then you have a situation whereby it becomes costly uh, to these people if they defend themselves. Now, some that don't have sufficient assets uh, just basically default, and then a judgment is uh, entered, and that is the end of that story right there, depending on, obviously, if uh, they are employed by someone, then they're uh, check can be garnished uh, if uh, they reach that level or if they have pension accounts or whatever. And of course, Jones has made enough money where he does not have to worry about this. Let's go now to a story that has been covered and highlighted. This is from the Times. In Indian country, a crisis of missing women. It talked about that, particularly in places like uh, Montana. And a new one when they are found. The federal government is trying to play catch-up. This issue has been out here for a very, very long time. This was actually written on the 25th uh, of December by... Uh, this is in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, Prudence Johnson spent uh, two years handing out missing person uh, flyers, searching homeless camps uh, on the pass for her 28-year-old daughter. When she got a call, she had been uh, praying for her that uh, Dana uh, had been found. She was in a New Mexico jail, but was still alive. It seemed like a happy ending to a story of one of thousands of Native American women and girls who are reported missing every year in what indigenous a activists called a long ignored crisis. Strangers uh, followed... Uh, Diney's uh, case on social media and so forth. Uh, but as uh, Jones uh, visited uh, Diney in jail, saw fresh scars on her body and tried uh, to comprehend the physical and spiritual toll of two years on the streets. Her family, which is Navajo, started to grip with the grapple, excuse me, with the pain and longly uh, uh, eulogized it uh, to uh, missing person saga. There's nothing what uh, comes after, Jones 48 said, who has five daughters. How do we heal? How do you put your family back together again? One thing I found, there was no support. There is not even a reliable account of how many Native Americans go missing or killed each year. Researchers have found that women are often misclassified as Latinos or Asian or other racial categories of uh, missing uh, persons and that thousands have been left off the federal missing persons uh, database from state capitals, tribal councils to the White House grassroots movements led by activists and victim families are casting a national spotlight on disproportionate high rate of violence faced by indigenous uh, women and uh, girls several states including New Mexico have set up a task force uh, President Trump signed an executive order last month creating a task force to improve Cooperation between bastardized and law enforcement agencies, balkanized, excuse me, <laughs> oops, it slipped there, and address the problem with basic uh, data collection, we'll call it big data. Some tribes collect, uh, some tribal officers praise the move, but other activists criticize it as a holler and uh, belated gesture that failed to include tribes of survival, uh, survivors in its membership. In other words, not even a very good show uh, effort. 
would do nothing to give tribes more uh, authority to prosecute sex traffickers and others who prey on women and girls. They said uh, its a focus on uh, rural reservations also overlooked the large number of native uh, people in cities who become targets of violence. Tanya Sweeney, Assistant Secretary of, for Indian Affairs in the Interior Department, said uh, the task force has already met with survivors, indigenous leaders in Arizona, Alaska, South uh, Dakota, and Washington State. No mention here of Montana. And was committed to including their voice in the recommendation. We need to do something. Well, but for all the official promises to help families uh, like Danny, uh, say uh, they get little assistance in navigating the patchwork tribal, state, and federal agencies. Nothing happens afterwards. That's a scary thing. And is uh, from a group called uh, Sovereignty Borders Institute. And has uh, tallied the number of missing and murdered uh, from a uh, jumble of uh, police reports, news, families, etc., etc. Ac- uh, activists describe the crisis as uh, the legacy of generations of government policies of forced removal, uh, land seizure. We're hearing more about that these days. Uh, the uh, public uh, radio had a very good series on that. Violence inflicted on indigenous people, hundreds of missing never return, and families say they struggle to find counseling and treatment for those who do. And that's the issue, uh, the theme of this article. There are also authorities and counselors who have failed to screen located in Navajo women and girls, a victim of sex trafficking. That's from Amber uh, Kassenbach uh, Cody, a Navajo Nation uh, delegate who has been studying the issue, the Yakima Reservation, that's in Yo- around Yakima, Washington, uh, in Washington State, said, uh, so happy, uh, I guess his last name, family spent three weeks looking for her after uh, she went missing. That was in August 2018. So happy, 36, said she had been lost in an addiction after being in an abusive relationship. A lot of this also happens out there. Uh, she said her drinking got worse and she grew more uh, dependent on until one night in November when she texts a suicide hotline as the last plea for help. This time it works. She's now in an outpatient treatment program in uh, Portland, Oregon. Let me whip down this. Around the Navajo Nation, voluntary activists set up their own version of Amber Alert to uh, supplement the spotty uh, official system. They pin missing person posters to the bulletin board of grocery stores. They provided a live accounting of missing uh, persons cases in January and October. 86 Navajo men and women have gone missing nationwide. A missing person advocate uh, for uh, Navajo Nation. Maski uh, Yaseti. She said 55 of them have been found uh, safe, 21 were found dead, and 10 were missing. That's since 2013. And back to Danny, uh, went missing uh, from Gallup, that's in New Mexico, in 2017 after years of drug use, personal and legal problems. So she lost custody of two young children several times earlier that year, was uh, charged uh, with things like burglary, freeing the police in a stolen truck etc. And of course they asked uh, that she not be identified by her full name. That's fine there too. And let me finish up the article here. Long running, but at least it's out here and a lot of people read of course uh, the New York Times. One night four women sat on double beds in a motel room looking at old pictures of themselves riding horses and at parties. And Disneyland Talking about their hopes of leaving a gallop uh, for a fresh start with relatives in the eastern U.S. And they uh, started uh, pacing the room. And uh, tweaking a cigarette as she edged towards the door. Her mother looked up and said, stay close, okay? So, in other words, yeah, this is an ever-changing uh, uh, situation here. And what happens uh, with people... Uh, and that's where we'll leave that one. Let's go to uh, uh, 
uh, we'll do Don Larson before who passed away here. Who uh, he was a Yankee who pitched the only perfect game in the World Series. Died at ninety. He retired after fourteen seasons with a losing record for his career. But one day in nineteen fifty six, he was a pitcher perfect. This is by Richard Goldstein. Don Larson, otherwise ordinary pitcher who achieved extraordinary, the extraordinary when he threw the only perfect game in the World Series history, died in uh, Hayden Lake, Idaho. He was 90 years old. Larson's son Scott said in a statement last week his father had uh, been treated for esophagus cancer, which was diagnosed uh, this uh, summer. When Larson took the mound against the Brooklyn Dodgers, that's when the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn, on October the 8th, uh, 1956, at the original Yankee Stadium. He was in the fourth season of a remarkable career. He pres- uh, he uh, posing him, uh, him, uh, posing physique for the time. He was six foot four, uh, 215 pounds or so. His frame uh, topped uh, by a bush cut and oversized ears. His repertoire of fastball, he had a slide and a curb, seemed weapon and seemed uh, weapon enough for a fine career. Larson had lost uh, 21 games pitching for the Baltimore Orioles two years earlier. He had difficulty with his control uh, there. Needlessly for one day, Larson was a pitcher of perfection. 27 times, the batters in the Dodgers lineup with four future Hall of Famers came to the plate and returned to the dugout with a hit, without a hit, a walk and error by a Yankees fielder. Larson's uh, two-zip masterpiece came uh, 39 years after the Major League had last witnessed a perfect game. No pitcher before or since has so much uh, as thrown a no-hitter in the World Series. Larson just said goofy things happened during spring training in 1956 in a St. Petersburg, Florida. He drove his car into a telephone pole while uh, returning to the team hotel around 4 a.m. He said days later that he had fell asleep at the wheel when he was asked about the incident. Through the years, he maintained he had not been drinking. Oh, well. He came away with nothing worse than a chip tooth. And this misadventure, Yankees... Uh, Teammates to dub him um, Goonie Bird. Not Looney Bird. Anyway, Larson went 11 and 5 in 56, uh, flushing uh, later in uh, the season when he developed what was an, an unorthodox no wind up delivery. You didn't see that back in those days, gave him a better balance while disguising the piss pitch selection. His manager, of course, was a legendary. Uh, Stacy uh, Stingle took a chance on him in game two, only to see him knocked out in the second inning. That was at the old Ebbets Field when the Dodgers scored uh, six runs for a 13 to 8 victory. When Larson arrived at uh, Yankee Stadium three days later, he had no idea where he would face the Dodgers again. He learned that he would uh, start game five. The series uh, tied at two games apiece, only when he found a uh, Baseball placed in one of his shoes, customary uh, signaling of a start assignment. By uh, Frank Cassetti, uh, he was the third base coach. Larson and the Dodgers, uh, Sal uh, Maggi, um, uh, going in the fourth inning, but Mickey Mantle hit a home run with two outs in the fourth to give the Yankees a one uh, one excuse me a one run lead. The Yankees had another one in the sixth. Larson breezed along, surviving a few scares. In a Dodgers' second ending, uh, Jackie Robinson led off hard shot that bounced off of third uh, baseman uh, Andy uh, Curry, Curry uh, and shortstop Gil uh, McDougal. Grabbed uh, the wretch and uh, threw out uh, Robinson, who was... Uh, Lacking speed in his early years. He hit off the fingertips of my glove. Uh, Carry uh, once recalled a few years before. 
Robinson uh, would have been uh, would have beat it out in the fourth inning. Duke Snyder, oh, Duke Snyder uh, missed a home run to the right by a few inches in the fourth. Gil Hodges, who'd later be a Yankee manager, dived to the left of center and was run down by Mantle and uh, Sandy uh, Alamore. Missed a home run uh, to a hair there. By the seventh inning, Larson knew he was working on a no-hitter, though but he didn't realize he had a perfect game. He uh, reached uh, three balls on only one uh, hitter. Pee Wee Reese, legendary later broadcaster, in the uh, first inning, his pitch hitting the corner of the plate throughout the afternoon. I never had control like that uh, uh, since, he told Sports Illustrated decades later. Teammates fearing that they would uh, jinx him uh, walked uh, away in the uh, dugout when he tried to start a, a conversation in the late stages. With more than 60,000 fans roaring uh, there, the Dodgers' uh, first uh, batter in the ninth, that was Carl Fiorito, and then uh, Roy Caponera, the, uh, the grounded out to second base. Dale uh, Mitchell, uh, an outfielder, pinch hitting uh, from Magley, uh, came to the base. As uh, Larson recalled, I said a small prayer. <laughs> and uh, with the uh, count, one ball, two strikes, he delivered a fastball. His 97 pitch. Mitchell uh, checked his swing, but the ump, uh, Babe uh, Pinelli, signal strike three and a few minutes uh, past three. A clock of baseball history had been made. The catcher there was none other than Yogi Bear leaped into Larson's arm. The madcap embraced, uh, captured in a photo that became a classic baseball image next to getting to the uh, Hall of Fame in 1972. It was probably my greatest thrill in baseball, Bear said. Larson became aware of it. He had pitched a perfect game only when he entered the Cub House. Donald James Larson was born in Michigan City, Indiana, but his parents, James and Charlotte Larson, moved the family to San Diego when he was 15 or so. His, he pitched for Point uh, Loomer High School, brought an official offer from the St. Louis Brown, 1947. David Wells, remember David Wells? He was uh, with uh, Toronto, I believe. Another one, alumni pitched a perk of game for the Yankees. In uh, 1998, against the Minnesota Twins, Larson reached the majors in 1953. When he was a uh, 7-12 for the Browns in St. Louis, he went 3-21-54 and and with the uh, perennial uh, Lonely Browns. Became uh, the, Boreal, uh, the uh, Baltimore Orioles, and he was traded to the Yankees in a 17-player deal. But gave them the fast baller uh, Bob Turley, who went on to win the 1958 uh, Cy Young as uh, baseball's finest pitcher. Pitcher, excuse me. Larson had a uh, nine to two record in '55 for the Yankees. After uh, his 11 victories in '56, he never won more than 10 games in the season. He was traded to the Kansas City Athletics. In 1959, a deal that brought Roger Maris to the Yankees. Two later, uh, Maris would set an iconic record, hitting uh, 61 uh, home runs to break Babe Ruth's uh, single season. He also pitched for the White Sox, the San Francisco Giants, and the Houston Astros, who were the uh, Code 45s. The Orioles again, and oddly enough, the Chicago Cubs. He retired at the 14th season with a record of 81 and 91, and he had pitched in uh, the World Series four times at the Yankees, once with the Giants. I'm not happy with my career record, uh, Larson once said. I could not. Uh, I could have been a better player. Parting had something to do with it, so he probably was drunk when he crashed the car. After leaving baseball, a salesperson for a paper products company in California. Larson spent his later years in the small town of Hayden Lake, Idaho, and the Panhandle. Larson enjoyed uh, fishing uh, at the lake adjoining his home. He also uh, appeared at 
autograph and memorabilia shows. Many have done it. Sold his uniform for the perfect game, the pinstripe jersey, bearing number 18 in his pants, the memorabilia dealer for $765,000 in uh, 2012 to provide uh, education for his grandsons. And his wife and son uh, survived him, Larson often said, but a day didn't go by when he didn't think about his uh, feet. He drove a car with a license plate, uh, DL00, initials on it there. The 45th uh, anniversary of his perfect day, game, excuse me, Larson uh, reflected anew on the moment. My belief is that you work hard and uh, something good's going to happen. He said, anyway, that was uh, Mr. Uh, Don uh, Larson. So many people have passed this week. I was reminded of a campaign I worked in uh, out in the Midwest. A uh, gentleman named uh, Landslide Wilson uh, passed. Uh, he was uh, running for city council seat in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he was elected by a mere two votes. Fantastic uh, story there, isn't it? Bill Landslide Wilson. Are you kidding him about that one time, a long time ago? Anyway, uh, on to a little bit of polling here. Let's do a little bit of polling. And uh, we'll go to Real Clear uh, Politics. And we'll run all these polls. And we'll have more polling, incidentally, on the week uh, that... Uh, was and uh, on uh, the uh, Monday morning quarterback. Anyway, this is some polling was out on Wednesday. Uh, this is Ugo, economist YouGov. The 2020 uh, Democratic nomination here has Biden up by 10 points at 29. Then comes Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren at 19 and 18 respectively. Little Peavy in the single the digits at 8. Amy Klobuchar at 4. The people in single digits. Incidentally, Leon Castro has officially put his uh, campaign on ice uh, because of uh, fundraising. And Marianne Williamson uh, has uh, basically uh, laid off her staff. She is the inspiration type, but she'll be on the ballot in New Hampshire. Anyway, let's see the approval rating here pegged uh, by the comments of DJ Trump at 44 disapproval. At 53, nothing new there. Generic ballot, Democrats up by 10, uh, 50 to 40. And, well, the congressional one is not there. Proof is only 17%. Anyway, wrong and right uh, direction. Wrong direction is up by 14 in this poll. And it would go to, on a Tuesday, a bunch of polls out there. The morning consult, that's Politico, has Biden up by 11. And uh, Bernie. By 21. Incidentally, Bernie came up with uh, with 35 million, leading in the donation switch stakes. And next, I believe, was a little mayor uh, from uh, South Bend had about 25 million, and some of the others had not announced. Uh, Joe Biden, and I think he's like maybe 22 million at best. And then you had some of the others uh, there uh, haven't announced yet, like uh, Liz Warren. She did tell some of the supporters she had about $17 million. Anyway, uh, where are we here? Um, old uh, Bloomberg is at 6. Amy Klobuchar is at 3. Now, this is national polls here. And if we go to Florida. This is Mason Dixon. Has Biden up by 247 to 45 over uh, D.J. Trump. And with Bernie, uh, D.J. Trump's up by 5. It's the first poll I've seen where uh, Bernie is... Uh, being led uh, by D.J. Trump. And uh, for Warren, um, D.J. Trump's up uh, 51 to 42 on her by 9 points. And Mayor Petey, he's up by 4 points uh, there, 49 to 45. And on to Virginia we go. Uh, uh, Biden's up by 4 on D.J. Trump. And uh, let's see what else we got going here. This is in the state of Virginia, Mason Dixon. Bernie Sanders is uh, Trump's leading Bernie by 6, 45 to 51 for Trump, and Liz Warren by 4. Very interesting poll there, uh, 44 to 48 for Trump, and uh, Mia Peavy behind by uh, 2 points there. Basically it. Let me just take a quick look 
at uh, we'll do Miss Mason Dixon we can get it up here in uh, Virginia we'll get it up here and we'll, we'll look at some of the uh, cross tabs here the Mason Dixon out of uh, DC and uh, Jacksonville Florida over the last few years Virginia has evolved from a state that lean Republican in presidential election then uh, first into a true swing state but now it's become uh, clear that uh, at least Democrats, still Democrats, uh, haven't completely taken Virginia for granted as a former VP is the only candidate who's beating a Trump. And this goes to it. And let's see here. We can see it in clear colors here. Let's get the undecided vote here. Uh, what is it? Uh, on Biden, Trump, 6%. On uh, Warren, Trump, 8%. On Sanders, Trump, just 4%. And uh, Mayor PD, 8% are undecided there. And uh, do you recognize a name? Uh, and do you have a favorable opinion? Uh, for Joe Biden, 51% had a favorable opinion. 33% uh, didn't recognize the name. Recognize in fable, recognize on fable. Anyway, 33%. DJ Trump, uh, everybody should know him by now. Favorable, 45%. Recognize and on fable, 48%. This is in Virginia, 7% with neutral. Elizabeth Warren, 36% uh, favorable and 51% on fable, uh, recognized on fable. Anyway, 10% with neutral and 3% didn't recognize the period. Bernie Sanders, 35% uh, favorable, 52% on favorable, 12% recognized neutral, and 1% there, and Buttigieg, very low figures here, 33% favorable, 30% on favorable, 21% recognized neutral, 16% didn't know who the hell he was. That's in the state of Virginia, and if we look at uh, women, uh, let's see what... Uh, Biden's at 49 in the state. Uh, Trump's at uh, 45 and 6% undecided. For men, Biden has 44%. Trump has 51%. For women, uh, way ahead uh, by Biden, he's 54 versus uh, 39. And 87% of Democrats uh, with Biden, 9% of Democrats with Trump. And the Republicans, 92% with Trump, 3% with Biden. 5% are undecided when we get into races here uh, with uh, Biden, 90% uh, of African Americans and 37% of Europeans, uh, with Trump, 57% of Europeans and 5% of African Americans. Hmm. Of whom would you vote uh, if the candidates were and they list who the candidates are? And in the state, uh, with Trump, 48%. Uh, with Warren, 44%. Won't go over all this. With men, 59% uh, with Trump, 35%. With Warren and with women, uh, it's turned around 38% with Trump and 53% of us. And with African Americans, 10% uh, uh, with Trump in this thing and 59% of Europeans. We warn 34% uh, of Europeans, 80% of African Americans in that setup. And with Bernie Sanders, 51% uh, there, 45% with uh, Sanders. Uh, with men, 57% and 46% of women are uh, with Trump. With, with Bernie, 40% uh, of men and 49% of women. And with the Democratic uh, ID here, 83% uh, with uh, Sanders and 13%, a higher number in this Virginia. Uh, Democrats uh, with uh, D.J. Trump. Independents in Virginia. Now, this breaks quite a bit of difference here. 60% of the independents were with uh, Trump and 34% with um, Bernie. And Europeans, 61% with Trump and... 36% with Sanders, 3% undecided. Uh, Trump, uh, in this particular setup, 14% with him, 77% were with uh, Bernie. It was a total of 625 registered voters nationwide interviewed live by phone. 
Interviews are randomly selected from a phone that matches Virginia voter registration list. The margin of error here is a plus uh, 4%. So that is that. And let's see, quickly go to Florida. If we can, I'm not sure we'll get Florida here. If not, we'll come back and... Yeah, we're not going to get Florida. And whom we're we going to this time around. Oh, it's the morning consult. Some of these we'll have on uh, the week, but it was. The morning consult is uh, political. We pretty much gave those out there. This again is more Mason uh, Dixon. And Virginia, of course, a little different state here. Yeah, uh, Virginia in uh, in Florida. Well, Florida is a more of a tight race. We see that right away from this Mason Dixon poll. Biden by only two. The margin of error is four. But at the same time, Trump's ahead of Bernie by five. Uh, Liz Warren by nine. The margin of error there. And Mia Peely with a margin of error of four. So a little different situation there. Virginia, Biden has a little more wiggle room in uh, Virginia and uh, Trump, uh, let's see, Trump's up on Bernie by 6 in uh, Virginia and let me see where we are, he's up by 5 in uh, Florida Florida of course being the more right wing than uh, Virginia, a lot of work to be uh, done uh, there, so we've gotten through this uh, well, Friday Jobber, I don't know what we'll do. We'll do Crisco later. Let me see if anything else we need to snatch up. No. We did Alex Jones that was uh, run out west to the Los Angeles Times. We don't really have anything on tap uh, for the Los Angeles uh, Times. This was on the uh, second, I believe we got this in here. Uh, yeah. I think, did we mention this? David Stern, who was a commissioner of NBA for 30 years of uh, passed. Uh, he was 77 years old and had an aneurysm, and evidently that is what caused him his uh, problem. But he was credited with bringing uh, basketballs out of the mountain of defeat uh, to victory and internationalizing the league. And, of course, uh, that is a, a, a sport that is very high concentration of African Americans there. The salaries are much better in basketball. The pension plans are better in basketball. Basketball is a much more democratic union. Of course, it goes worldwide. In fact, uh, basketball is, uh, on a global basis, number two behind uh, football or soccer, and it's very, very big. So again, and with their uh, big schedule, because at one time, basketball, you had football, baseball, and basketball in the U.S. It was so bad that uh, the basketball finals were uh, tape delayed. Now that's not the case. Of course, now they are on uh, pay for you, and other things have uh, have happened uh, there with the uh, economics of uh, sports. We'll have more about that on uh, eventually on all about sports. That's where we look at sport. Nonetheless, this is uh, Boston Red on the third day of January, twenty twenty. In the Jerry Pippen broadcast booth. Do, uh, if you uh, have uh, the moment, uh, check out our uh, New Year's Eve show. And also we did Kwanzaa where we talk about the state of African Americans and the Kwanzaa celebration which Dr. Uh, Marana Karinga uh, and his movement uh, for the general good has expanded it, the uh, general good, global good. And you can find his address actually uh, on that episode, uh, 2019. Have a good weekend, everyone. We'll talk to you on the week that was and then the Monday morning quarterback on this channel. Incidentally, we have a numbers man there with, where we recap uh, 2019. It's up. On the uh, Numbers Man show on various places, you can find that broadcast, very, very popular broadcast, where we talk about the state of the economy from a macro point of view. Good day.